Hi, today I'll be talking about this paper, Explainable Reinforcement Learning via Reward Decomposition. This paper is by Zoe Uazapaitis, Anurag Kaul, Alan Fern, Martin Erwig, and Fanal Doshi Villas. The aim of this paper is to explain agents' decisions to the users in terms of different components of the reward function. I believe the idea presented here would work well for debugging whether shaping rewards that are usually given by the RL practitioners would be helpful or would dominate the actual environment's reward or not. Let's take an example. A driver RL agent can have reward sourcing from different factors like safety, time taken to reach the goal, the route taken, and so on and so forth. Then the explanation for choosing the action stop instead of the action accelerate can be, well, I did this because the reward type safety was more critical than the reward type time to goal. The focus of this paper is at the fact that reward decomposition, specifically for explanations, has not been tried before. Although there are works that do use such decompositions, but they do it only to speed up the agent training and are not fit for explanations. The theme of this problem is pretty simple and something that we've already looked at a lot of times before. The idea is that users might disapprove of certain actions or sequences of actions taken by the agent and now they've asked this question that why didn't you do this other thing that I might have expected and it is the agent's responsibility to answer this question. One of the ways that the agent is going to do it in this paper is hope that explaining action preferences in terms of meaningful types could provide significant insight to the users. This is what the authors have pointed out here. The paper moves ahead with this assumption that we can somehow decompose the total reward into certain components. Reward decomposition works would also decompose the q-value function such that the final q-value is the sum of all the component qc values where these component q-value functions are obtained by using the corresponding component reward. Here they show that this reward function is actually a vector where each index is the corresponding reward component. The reward, that is the total reward, is sum of these individual components. And the final Q value is also the sum of the individual component Q values, as I just mentioned. At this point, it is also important to note that there is a distinction, which the authors also point out, between this type of reward decomposition and the temporal reward decomposition that might exist. So here, what we are talking about is that at a certain point or at a certain time t, many factors can contribute to the total reward like safety or time to goal and things like that. However, there is another kind of reward decomposition that exists through time. That is, I will get this particular reward at time t, this other reward at time t plus one and things like that. So here that, that is why the authors have made this distinction between temporal reward decomposition and this, this notion of decomposing the reward itself into different factors. Now this other style, that is the temporal reward decomposition, has already been studied a lot in hierarchical RL and the users make it clear beforehand that these two decomposition styles are pretty orthogonal with respect to this work. So what is the problem that we are trying to tackle in, in, in certain technical detail? We need the component Q values to converge to the optimal component Q star. Now, although the final policy can be fine, the problem that authors find in the component Q value update in previous works like HRA and SARSA, specifically HRA for now, is that the component Q values do not converge to the optimal component Q star. Well, this happens with HRA. For algorithms like SARSA, which does make the component Q values converge, SARSA reflects the exploratory policy the agent had taken during the training rather than the greedy policy the agent has during the test time. This can lead to explanations that may seem unintuitive. This is what the authors point out here. However, I could not find any example in this paper where SARSA gives an unintuitive explanation. Now this point makes sense because, well, if you are trying to explain through these factors, then I must be sure that the Q values that I'm using to use the factors in the explanation are correct. Now, if there are some random values, I cannot be sure that those factors are the actual factors that contributed to the selection of that action. However, 
if those q values are the actual converged q values q component values then i'm pretty sure that you know this particular factor was independent of other factors contributed this much towards the choice that i made for this particular action and hence it makes sense to pursue this idea that what i want is an algorithm that not only converges to the optimal total q value for the final policy but also converges in terms of the component q values this is what this work will try to do in the first part of this paper first it is their algorithm in their algorithm and other baselines one update happens for each component q value for every action that is taken while training this update is the well known q value update that we see almost everywhere in rl the more niche change is how to select the action for which this component q value update is made in sarsa the on policy action is chosen in hra the component wise best action is chosen let's call it local best action however in drq which is their contribution the best action on the cumulative q value is chosen and the update to component q value is made for this best action so here they are choosing the best action over the sum of these component q values and not the individual q values note that this global best action for which we are making the updates can be different from the local component wise best actions the component wise stuff is what the hra does this global stuff is what they are doing that's the change the authors stress that such a change achieves global convergence of q values as well as convergence of each of the component qcs they propose a proof for which i could not find in this paper they say that it is provided in the full paper but i could not find that either i have reached out to the authors for the proof and i am waiting to hear back from them they also present a simple extension of this method from tabular q values that was there in algorithm 1 to approximated q values like approximation through multi layer perceptrons which is given here it's pretty straightforward too now let's get into the most interesting part of this paper that is how do we use these decompositions of rewards for explanation when a user asks why not action b instead of the agent's actual action a the system can provide details called as rdx about which reward types helped in choosing action a over b and which types pushed towards b however as seen in previous works explanations must be compact and to the point hence they propose a way to reduce this detail finally the system provides two kinds of sets consisting of these decomposed reward types to explain the decision a positive set that tells that these factors contributed most in choosing action a and a negative set that favors the alternate action that was suggested that is b these sets are what they call as minimal sufficient explanation set or msx now suppose the reward is not a single real number but rather a vector of real numbers where each index is a reward type so here r1 and r2 are two types of rewards as in when in state s i took the action a i get reward r1 which is in fact a vector where each index let's say here 0 is the reward that was sourced from this reward type c1 which can be safety similarly there is this reward r2 which was given when on the state s i took action b and instead of 0 here i'm getting 1 for the reward type c1 now these rewards can end up giving us q1 and q2 which as you can guess is a vector as well now rdx or the reward difference explanation is literally the difference between q1 and q2 that is the q value that i would get if i take action a minus the q value that i would get if i take the action b well as you can figure out this rdx would in fact be a vector itself where each of the types would be well each of the indices would be the types now this could have been the final explanation but the problem is the size of such a vector depends upon the number of reward components and that can exceed what users can comprehend right hence the authors provide a way to possibly reduce the size of such a set this is where minimal sufficient explanation or msx comes in msx has two parts msx plus and msx minus msx plus consists of subset of components that prefers action a over b and similarly msx minus prefers b over a now we'll talk about how do we get msx plus and minus for msx plus it's pretty simple in the vector of rdx 
we can see that there are both kinds of values, positive as well as negative values. Now the positive values mean advantage of action A over action B and negative values mean disadvantage of action A over action B. To get MSX plus, we need to calculate first a value. First, we'll sum up all the disadvantages to get a value called as D. So here we'll sum up minus three and minus two to get minus five We'll take the mod of it because we only care about the actual magnitude, which is 5. And this value is now called as D. Then among all the positive values in the RDX, we need to find the minimum sized subset that exceeds this value D. Hence, if positive and negative are two opposing forces, MSX plus consists of the factors in the positive set that just overpowers the total disadvantage from all the negative factors. In this example, therefore, MSX plus would consist of, well, it can, it can be anything as long as it sums greater than D. Now, there are some rules that the authors have pointed out, which is we chose the ones which is the smallest size set and we chose the ones, if there are a like, competition, then we'll choose the one which is lexographically smaller or lexographically ordered. Then in this case, we would have something like 2, 4, 1, oh no, 2, 4, which sums as 6 and is greater than D. MSX plus answers this question that why should I choose action A over B and what advantages does action A give over B? On the other hand, MSX minus answers the critical disadvantages of choosing A over B. So although A is the final choice by the agent, it can potentially have certain drawbacks too. We list out those critical drawbacks through MSX minus. Now to get that, what we do is we sum up all the MSX values and we have to find a value. Now sum of MSX plus values should barely cross the total disadvantage D. Now let's remove the smallest contributor to MSX plus. So in our set, which was 2, 4, let's remove the smallest contributor, which makes it to be just 4. Now that should make the sum of the remaining elements in the MSX plus be less than D. So remember our D was 5. So now our MSX plus, this new set, is less than D, which is 4 less than 5. Now let's call this value from the MSX minus set as V. Now what we need to do is we need to sum up all the disadvantages and get the minimum set again, but that set should barely cross this value V. Now this new set that we would get is exactly MSX minus. Now although all of this is interesting, MSX plus and minus are just a way of utilizing the knowledge about decomposed components contributing towards the selection of an action. As I said before, this method can help in debugging scenarios, especially when the designer is adding rewards or shaping rewards. Well, this is also highlighted in the two case studies given in, in this paper. If you found this paper interesting, do check out the previous video on the trade of focus contrastive explanations. Thank you.